International Criminal Court deters civilian deaths, recent research and implications for Syria, sponsored by the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. I'm Catherine Sickens. I'm the Ryan Professor of Human Rights Policy here at the Kennedy School. And uh, I'm very uh, pleased to introduce this panel. Uh, we are first going to hear from Professor Beth Simmons from the Government Department at Harvard here. She is going to present re results, briefly present results from a yet unpublished paper about the impact of the ICC on civilian deaths in wartime. Uh, we're then going to have commentary from the former and first prosecutor of the National Criminal Court, Luis Moreno Campo, uh, who will both comment on, on the paper, but also will use it as a backdrop to present his own innovative proposal that the Security Council should uh, refer the Syria case to the ICC, but with delayed jurisdiction. Uh, and. Uh, um, so, so I want to, I'm going to introduce uh, Beth Simmons right now, uh, later we'll introduce more fully uh, Moreno Campo, Luis Moreno Campo. Uh, Beth Simmons is the Claire and Dillon Professor of International Affairs at the Government Department of Harvard. She is simply one of the most important international relations scholars of her generation. Uh, she has most recently produced this uh, prize winning book, Mobilizing for Human Rights, International Law and Domestic Politics won three prizes, the Woodrow Wilson Prize, the Stein Rokin Prize, and a, 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 a prize from the American Society of National Law. Um, it is simply the most important book by, recent book by a social scientist on international law and international institutions. Um, and so we're very excited to have that present new research that builds off the, t the point of the book but moves it to new territory that is looking at impact of law uh, on, uh, uh, and, and particularly international institutions like the International Criminal Court, on human rights issues on the ground, particularly civilian death. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think we're going to have a wonderful discussion today because my work has dealt briefly with the effect of international law and institutions on outcomes that we might care about. I'm not an expert on the International Criminal Court, but it is something that I have felt very strongly about bringing evidence to in a very, very systematic way. And so I want to pre present some research today on uh, some work that I've been doing with Heron Joe, who is at uh, Texas A&M University. And I'm trying to go this direction. So let me just say a little bit about the state of research on the International Criminal Court, and just a little bit about the court itself. You just saw the film. So you know something, you probably anyway knew something about its operation. Uh, but the International Criminal Court is frequently criticized as not being an effective institution because it hasn't done much and can't do much. And that, I think, is the point to start with. It has a small capacity, maybe a limited capacity to punish, having convicted only one person in 12 years. Another very common criticism that you might have heard about the International Criminal Court is that it cannot deter because it is a weak institution. It can't punish very severely. It uh, can't put uh, death penalty into place, for example. Uh, parties often will not cooperate with it. So despite all the ratifications we saw in the film, uh, you don't often uh, hear a lot of people sort of praising cooperation with the International Criminal Court. And also, of course, the likelihood of prosecution, therefore, many people argue, is just way too low to deter uh, the crimes that the ICC was created to try to address. Uh, many will even argue, uh, as you saw in that little opening film, that you know, one of the things that it attempts to address is international peace and security. And many people will also argue that it has done exactly not that. The presence of the International Criminal Court has stretched out conflict, has made it more difficult to uh, begin peacemaking processes and that that type of problem as well, uh, if someone is afraid that they're going to be um, prosecuted by the court, they may hide, they may hold out, they may not be willing to negotiate, etc. Okay, so these are the kinds of criticisms that we hear about the International Criminal Court. And overall, I would say that most of this research, you know, I even hesitate sometimes to even call it all research. Some of it is just criticism of the International Criminal Court is quite right, widespread. So what, what we were trying to do in this paper is to see if we could bring any systematic evidence to bear on these claims. So uh, we want to today, I think, present some of the, Heron Joe, I speak for Heron, it's too bad she can't be here, but we want to present some of the empirical material that we put together to try to sort of sharpen 
our assessment of the International Criminal Court. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is a very partial step in that direction. It really asks, can the ICC reduce atrocity through deterrence? Now, there are many other things we might want the ICC to do, but I'm going to be sort of rather circumscribed in the kinds of things that I can look at today, and that's part of being systematic. It's going to be a deeper look at one particular kind of crime rather than sort of saying, can the ICC do everything everybody would love it to do? Okay, so I'm going to take a little bit of a deep dive, and I think this is a critical, critical issue as to whether or not it can deter. And I want to admit from the very get-go, it's a very complex and difficult issue to establish causality. It's critical, though, to try to design research that can look at some of the claims about the International <coughs> Criminal Court, rather than just putting together headlines or impressions or that kind of thing. So I think it's really critical to do the best we can do. I'm trying to do the best I can do as a social scientist to try to bring together systematic evidence to bear. I can very briefly look at this slide. We already uh, saw a little bit of uh, introduction. It prosecutes crimes associated with mass atrocities, serious war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide. Uh, and, the, oh, and, and what the crimes I'm going to be looking at in this paper are a small subset of the crimes that it actually could prosecute. So if we're going to look at everything the ICC can do, we'd have to go beyond looking at intentional civilian killing. There's a lot of other things that the ICC can certainly do. But we're going to take a, a, a rather systematic look at civilian killings itself. Uh, in terms of its jurisdiction, it, is, uh, it has, takes, takes jurisdiction after 2002. Um, jurisdiction is, as just as the film was saying, uh, by a national of a state party to the treaty or in the territory of a state party to the treaty or in situations referred to by the Security Council or on the volition of the prosecutor under certain circumstances. The potential of this institution is very real, and that is it can put people in prison for life. So this is an international institution, including heads of state, put uh, certain individuals into prison for life. So it has very real effects in that sense. And I want to stress that it's complementary to national prosecutions. Very important because part, as I'm going to argue today, part of an ICC effect is the incentives it gives states to develop and build their own capacities when it comes to prosecution. Okay? So it's very, very important to realize that it's complementary to national prosecutions. So what we develop in this paper is a behavioral theory of deterrent crime. And we don't have to make this up from the get-go. We can build on the shoulders of those who've taken a long and careful look at crime. First of all, I want to de distinguish two different types of deterrence. One is general deterrence, and the idea behind general deterrence is that it has the ability to deter actors who have not yet committed the crime, okay? So those who might think about committing the crime, whereas specific deterrence means that an individual who has been prosecuted has, is deterred from doing it again if they've been punished, okay? So this paper is looking at the idea of general deterrence. And our point of departure here is to sort of take a sort of a rational economic model of, of uh, deterrence, and this is just based on uh, theory that has been out there for quite a long time, since 1968 at least. And it says that deterrence really is a function of two things. It's a function of how strong the punishment is and how likely, the hood, how likely you are to get caught. Okay? So there are two mechanisms through which the International Criminal Court could potentially affect the mechanisms both of how severe a punishment is and how likely it is to be caught. The two general categories that we look at here is prosecutorial deterrence, and this is legalized, court-ordered punishment. It is sentencing, sentencing, basically. That is what almost everybody is thinking about when they think about the International Criminal Court. So when we hear discussions about doesn't have the capacity, can't catch you know, perpetrators and this kind of thing, they're talking about the first dash here under these mechanisms. Prosecutorial deterrence. That is not the only kind of deterrence out there. Very importantly, the crime literature takes another kind of deterrence very seriously. And we can call it social deterrence. The idea with social deterrence is that costs are also imposed by the broader social context in which the crime takes place. So the question then arises, what is the relevant 
community, broadly speaking, who can impose costs on someone alleged to have committed a crime. And I have to use alleged in that sentence because we are talking about social pressure and not prosecute, whether or not they've been prosecuted and actually found guilty. Okay? So these are two different kinds of deterrence that can be operating. So prosecutorial deterrence, uh, the theory weights certainty and severity of the punishment very equally, but the empirical research that has been done on deterrence says that certainty generally matters more than severity does. So the key to deterrence, a big part of deterrence, is have you raised the likelihood at all of being caught? Okay? And so the estimates of certainty can be um, more heavily influenced by cooperation, cooperation of states and that type of thing. The sentences are set, okay? But the variable here is how much you raise the likelihood of being caught, okay? The likelihood of being caught. And the ICC, I would argue, actually does this. It increases the certainty time severity calculation very critically compared to impunity. Yes. Compared to impunity. This is a very important point. So the point is not, do we want to compare the ICC to an ideal institution which finds every criminal and punishes, punishes them severely? That's not what we can compare this institution to. It is not what we would compare any domestic institution to. Instead, the question is, how and to what extent does it increase the risks to criminal behavior compared to impunity? And we can look at that directly in terms of ICC uh, jurisdiction, indictments, investigations, and prosecutions, which change the perceptions of the certainty of getting caught over time. And we have to look indirectly as well because of the complementarity mechanism that I was just discussing. So the idea that when national capacity is developed via cooperating with the uh, ICC, um, by sort of fulfilling the one's state's obligations under the IC, by criminalizing ICC crimes in domestic law, when that happens, it also increases this calculation indirectly as well. Very, very important. Now, what is this social deterrence idea? So social deterrence, again, just put up this uh, relationship here that is kind of my starting point. Social deterrence can affect this calculation as well because law interacts with social settings to alter this calculation of the severity and likelihood of punishment. So criminologists have found some very interesting things when they look at what deters people. They find very, very often that extra legal consequences are just as important, sometimes <coughs> more important, than the legal consequences. So when people ask sort of why, uh, so in, in settings where um, uh, they sort of inquire and investigate drunk driving behavior, for example, Drunk driving behavior is more deterred by what your family and friends will think of you than it is by the actual likelihood that you will actually be pulled over and actually have to go to jail or pay a fine or something of that nature. And so the criminology literature is actually pretty clear that this social deterrence is, can be a very, very, have a very strong effect. And we know from the human rights literature that extra legal norm enforcement goes on all the time at the international level, through trade and trade agreements, as Emily Hoffner Burton has written, um, through transnational relationships and non-governmental organizations, as Catherine and, and her co-authors have stressed over time. And in the book that uh, Catherine was just holding up, where I looked at the domestic sources of social movements that also create pressure to comply with international legal agreements. So, and these are all extra legal. None of those ones I just mentioned have much to do with literally going to prison, but they have a lot to do with uh, the value of your social capital, so to speak, okay? So that's what I mean by social deterrence. And the ICC has literally altered these costs over time. How does it do it? It defines very clearly what wrongdoing is. It collects commitments from the international community, and it raises social expectations about what constitutes unacceptable behavior, and that there will not be a tolerance of impunity anymore, okay? So even if prosecutorial deterrence fails, social deterrence could be at work. <coughs> Why? Because it, would affect the, it could affect the certainty of some paying some kind of a social cost. So for example, by increasing information, simply by investigating, for example, 
this could bring wrongdoing to light and potentially certain actors could pay social costs, whether in terms of their social network, their ability to govern, maybe even in terms of their access to material support, those things could be at risk. In terms of severity, these could be amplified by a broad range of informal structures. And so we can think of a continuum of social pressures that might be very material in nature. You know, there could be states that respond uh, that we are not going to cooperate by trading or investing, or they could limit their uh, diplomatic support for a state on the one hand, or a, I should say set of actors on the one hand, or uh, they could simply denounce, and that could have its diplomatic costs in terms of reputational costs as well. So I'm thinking of this sort of on a continuum. So let me think about what the hypotheses might be then if this framework is useful. In terms of direct prosecutorial deterrence, we should expect that actions that increase the risk of ICC prosecution should reduce war crimes where? Where the cost and the risk of being prosecuted are higher. Therefore, we should expect ratification itself, which extends jurisdiction, to have some effect over this calculation. But more so, we're looking also for indications that would affect an actor's assessment about what is the likelihood I'm going to be prosecuted. And we should also see some consequences when we see investigations, indictments, prosecutions, other signals that the ICC is determined not to allow impunity to continue. So when we see those kinds of actions, we should expect actors to reduce their intentional killing or take other actions to reduce uh, uh, the breach of ICC-defined crimes. In terms of uh, indirect prosecutorial deterrence, we should expect, expect that actions that increase the risk of a national prosecution should have a similar effect through complementarity. Those kinds of uh, institution-developing moves domestically should have a similar kind of effect. So for example, implementation of ICC-consistent domestic criminal statutes should also increase this assessment of the possibility that I could be prosecuted. Military reforms, for example, to detect and punish prohibited tactics might also be associated with reductions in war crimes of various kinds and other forms of uh, violations of ICC law. And then finally, in terms of social deterrence. Social deterrence, we should, the key with social deterrence is it only matters if you care about your social capital. So there is a name for individuals who don't care about what anybody thinks about them. They are called hardened criminals. Hardened criminals. <coughs> hardened criminals don't care. They don't care what the rest of society thinks about them. They may care what their network of other hardened criminals think. But generally speaking, they are not going to be socially deterred. So it's a very conditional argument. I really want to stress this. Nobody thinks that the ICC is some kind of a magic institution that changes everything. It simply changes calculations that we can test. Okay? So we would expect social deterrence to be strong. For example, when government forces are very independent on the inter very dependent on the international community. And if they're not very dependent on the international community, then sort of social deterrence coming from what others expect around the world is not going to be strong. But if they depend on the international community for aid, trade, investment, uh, then it's more likely that social deterrence will kick in. Similarly, uh, in terms of government forces, if they have a lot, they have to be also thinking about being socially deterred by their own domestic audiences as well. So to the extent that human rights organizations make it costly, for government forces to commit atrocity, that also cuts into their ability to govern at reasonable cost, and it also can raise their costs through social, what I'm terming social deterrence as well. Finally, this is one of the few studies that looks at rebel deterrence. So rebels are not parties to the international statutes, uh, but nonetheless, they are under the statutes. They're governed by the statutes where they have, where they have jurisdiction. And so I want to advance so a little bit of thinking about government rebels as well. For the most part, government rebels are extremely difficult to deter. But not all. Not all. Because it comes back to the idea of social deterrence. If they want 
to govern, they're going to need social capital. They're going to need relationships with the rest of the world. They're going to need relationships with a domestic audience such that if they do come to power, they will have enough social and governing capital that they can actually rule at reasonable cost. Okay? So the conditional argument is to the extent and only when rebels actually have a goal of governing will it be likely that they will be socially deterred. Okay? So now what does this evidence look like? The dependent variable, what I'm trying to explain, and again only one ICC crime, there are many others, is whether civilians have been killed intentionally. And so I'm looking at two levels, by government forces on the one hand and by rebel forces on the other. The sample is a set of countries. All of the countries that I'm looking at have had some civil war experience between 1945 and 2011. Okay? And the unit of analysis is 297 government rebel dyads. And the temporal coverage of the study is from 1989 to 2011. So we have basically 102 countries, a good-sized sample, 262 rebel groups, 44 ratifiers, 58 non-ratifiers, and 66 rebels with governance aims. Okay? So those are the ones that we would think would alter their behavior okay, in term, when, they, when they see the ICC, uh, when the ICC begins to uh, be uh, a, a sort of a, um, actively investigating in that type of thing. Okay? So the explanatory variables here are a theoretical interest we have. First of all, anything that affects direct prosecutorial deterrence, and that would be ratification right off the bat because of the uh, extension of jurisdiction. One of the primary uh, conditions is ratification. Indirect prosecutorial deterrence, uh, if the country started to change its domestic crime statutes. Uh, and a, a third example for social deterrence would be a growth in the number of human rights organizations domestically, uh, and also we would expect um, that to uh, in both interact domestically and internationally as well. We would expect social deterrence to, have, um, to be influenced by the number of human rights organizations domestically on the ground and international human rights organizations. Control variables, of course, we don't want to just pick up all kinds of things that are happening because of the way states are fighting on the states and rebels are fighting on the ground. So we need to control for things like rebel strength, political regime type, peacekeeping, other experiences at, at sort of trying to um, come to some kind of a just solution, international other experiences with international tribunals because we're trying trying very much to kind of focus on the effect of ICC decisions. And so what we find basically is that in terms of prosecutorial dependence, we find that government forces reduce intentional killing when they are under ICC jurisdiction. So compared, Ceteris Paribus, with a lot else held constant, uh, when a government has ratified the ICC conventions, they tend, government forces tend to reduce their intentional killing. They also tend to reduce their intentional killing even more above and beyond that effect when national crime statutes conform with ICC crimes. In terms of social deterrence, what we find, and again, this is all for government forces now, is that government forces reduce intentional killing under ICC jurisdiction when human rights uh, organizations grow and gain strength. So there is something to say for effects on the ground as well in terms of civil society development, sort of holding governments accountable. And so thinking of that as deterring as well. Internationally, government forces reduce intentional killing when they're more dependent on foreign aid which is consistent with a hypothesis of social deterrence. Now let me just say a few things about rebels, rebel forces, rebel groups. Very difficult to deter. And we're not expecting all rebels to simply lay down their arms and not kill anybody because of the International Criminal Court. But what we're looking at here again is a count of civilians killed by rebels. We're looking now specifically at the effect of ratification on rebels with a governance aim. Okay, so that it's a conditional argument. We're controlling again for rebel strength, uh, lootable, lootable uh, resources, amnesty granted to rebels, peacekeeping. And the results basically are that rebels that are motivated by enrichment, okay, those that are there to you know, simply make money, you know, scoop up diamonds, and simply to enrich their members and don't really want to govern, don't want either to establish a separate state or take over the core of a state, those, 
they're just not deterred by the ICC, no matter what, uh, what we try to do with the data. Groups with governance aims, however, have a very different outcome. Ratification reduces intentional killing significantly for those groups who have a, have a uh, claimed an intentional uh, aim, war aim, to govern. Okay. Now, uh, let me just uh, show you just, this is, this just, I don't even know if we need to look at the numbers here, maybe, but this is just sort of a sense of some of the numbers. This is the uh, impact on civilian killing by rebel groups. Negative means it's a reduction in civilian killing. Uh, and it is a very significant uh, reduction uh, when you have the ICC ratification and autonomy-seeking rebel groups who actually want to govern, okay? Um, so you get a, a negative uh, effect, a reduction in, uh, in uh, intentional civilian killing uh, under those circumstances. I'm going to very briefly say something about Uganda. Very br I, I won't take, what, two more minutes? Yes. You're delighted. All right, very quickly, what about, you know, let's look more deeply into one case. So the ICC, this was the first case among eight other situations the ICC looked into. Um, this was a case of uh, civil war, the Ugandan government versus the Lord's Resistance Army. And we are expecting it to be very hard to see any deterrence for the Lord's Resistance Army. So we're expecting uh, that it's going to be difficult because, um, and we're looking somewhat here for direct prosecutorial deterrence having to do with investigation. So the hypothesis here is that they reassess their risks of being prosecuted when the ICC starts to send very strong signals that they're going to take action, okay? We might also expect some indirect prosecutorial deterrence through the ICC bill. That's a domestic law change in Uganda, but we're not expecting very much social deterrence of the Lord's Liberation Army, Lord's Resistance Army, I'm sorry. Well, this gives you a sense of the dependent variable. This, this is the um, number of LRA attacks on civilians. This is not exactly the number of deaths, okay? This is the number of attacks, though, and these are violent attacks, very likely correlated anyway with killing of civilians, okay? And so what we see, first of all, there's a problem here. As soon as we see ICC signature and ratification, when we see ratification, we see a big increase in killing. And, you know, I am not sure what is, you probably have a story for that. It has to do with, um, people have told me, for example, that there was something rather strategic going on with the government of Uganda intentionally provoking uh, increased violence, thinking that there would be some kind of response by the rebels, and then the rebels could be taken to the ICC, okay, potentially prosecuted. There could be something strategic going on there. Um, so that's, that's a sort of a troubling relationship. We see ICC ratification, and then we see um, a lot of uh, rebel attacks on civilians. But look what happens as you move on. Investigation, and then we see a falling off in the number of intentional rebel attacks. We see warrants, and we see ceasefires, all of these uh, in a period of, of, um, uh, uh, of uh, decline in uh, the number of civilian attacks. And I guess my, I would like to just put a question on the table. When I was doing this research, I was very worried. I was very worried that what we were going to find is that the prosecutor would not choose to prosecute until there was peace on the ground, okay? Until it was less likely that there would be violence. So I was worried about the causation going the other direction. And I'm not sure we solved that, but I'd love to hear your comment on that. <laughs> because uh, we, have a, we have a problem to our inference. We have a problem for drawing inferences if the prosecutor is waiting till peace to prosecute, you see? Then we're attributing the peace to the prosecution. And that would, that would be a problem. Can you comment on it now? Huh? Can you comment on it now? You keep moving. You don't know, copy, I kind of make a comment on your comment now, yeah. and then you keep sure, moving. Sure, sure. Uh, but you need to stand up. Okay. And so people... That, that's a big thing, what she said, because in fact, when we indicted Joseph Coney, that was coming, even an NGO, saying stop, stop, stop. Diana and Leicher would pushing for punishment in Latin America, saying, oh my God, stop. Yeah. And in fact, we're carefully discussing this issue internally, and we adopt the policy, peace is not our business. Security Council is in charge of peace. So our mandate is justice. And if any big criminal can blackmail us, mm -hmm. kill more people, yeah. we are dead. Good. Yeah. So we, the, policy, the, the policy was clearly, go ahead. That's what I was hoping to hear. 
Uh, that's very much what I was hoping to hear because uh, it would have been very problematic for drawing inferences if it had been the other way around. But basically what you have heard are clear reasons why the prosecutor would have incentives, basically, to do what is just rather than to do what appears to be expedient at the time. Right? I mean, sort of, more or less? Yeah. It's funny. You can find professor for law, Bill Book White, I like him very much, saying the big mistake of the prosecutor is to try to have distance from the politicians. Mm -hmm. He had to understand international relations about states, and then he had to follow the state. Yeah. But if I follow the state, I never have a case. Yes, sir. Because before the peace process, they are saying, oh my god, you are interfering with this process here. Yeah. And they wait for us. Yeah. And when they sign the peace process, they say, you cannot yeah. prosecute because now, uh -huh. just sign the peace process. Yeah. So it's never, yeah. basically. Yeah. 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 So that, I will talk about this, because for me, basically what you are talking is, what is normal at the national level, and that's why I love it, that you confront IDC against impunity. Yes. That's, the, that's, that's, the, the, that's the comparison, because basically the global order is about impunity. It's about agreement between leaders, and leaders internally can commit crime. That's it. No mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. So we are changing that, and that's why it's so controversial and so complicated. And basically, uh, we'll see how it's evolving, but I like you showing how useful it could be. Mm. Great, and I'm just about done, uh, and then I would just... So all, all of this is showing us, basically, is that the, that the uh, Lord's Resistance Army increased the tax after ratification, but reduced them after investigation. So when it became more likely that they, were, that they might be exposed, they reduced their tax on civilians, uh, okay? And so this is just the numbers on that. Uh, some more, this is control variables. We don't need to look at all that, but simply to wrap up now, uh, I just want to conclude. No, 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 no. I, I'm sure everybody would just love a change of pace in their view. But basically, I, I really want to point out that there are, very, there are three relevant sources of ICC deterrence. And we're thinking too narrowly if we allow the debate to simply be what are the chances the ICC is going to put somebody in jail. That's not the right debate to be having. Okay? There are three relevant sources of ICC deterrence. Direct prosecutorial, and that's what most people talk about. But indirect prosecutorial, will they ever be prosecuted domestically? And that increases as domestic institutions develop capacity. And finally, and very important, the idea of social deterrence. Okay? So what, I've, the, what this study tries to do is at least prevent some suggestive evidence of the ICC's deterrent potential with a lot of caveats about uh, you know, remaining challenges ahead with sometimes lack of support from major players, regional players, budget issues, collecting of evidence, capturing of suspects, to the extent that that certainty gets raised, the deterrence ability of the ICC should improve. But even now, it seems like there is some suggestive evidence that deterrence is beginning to work. So. OK, so we welcome Luis Moreno of Campo. Luis is Argentine, uh, and from 1986, no, 1985 through 1992, he was a federal prosecutor in Argentina. He really came to uh, the world's attention uh, as the deputy prosecutor uh, against the military juntas and the, in the trial of the juntas in 1985 in Argentina. He followed that up as the chief prosecutor against a series of um, generals who had been leaders of the um, of the dirty war in Argentina, uh, including uh, Suarez Mason uh, cooperating with the U.S. on rendition of Suarez Mason from California to Argentina. He also um, carried out the prosecutions against the leaders of two military coups against the Alfonsín government. And, and his next big interest was on pursuing cases of, of corruption. Uh, in Argentina against bankers, financiers, uh, federal judges, national ministers, and so forth, who had profited so prolifically from uh, the time of the dictatorship. Uh, he left and opened a, a private law firm in uh, 1992 uh, mm -hmm. that focused on uh, dealing with the issues of corruption in particular among major institutions while also working on human rights cases, uh, many on a pro bono uh, basis. 
Uh, in the mid-90s, Luis brought uh, Transparency International into Argentina, served on their international board, and founded an NGO called Poder Ciudadano, uh, Citizen Power, uh, believing that uh, Argentina needed to develop practices of mobilization of the public on issues rather than on political parties and conducted a number of very, very innovative campaigns uh, in the country. So uh, we've been friends uh, for a long time. What has always impressed me is uh, his uh, tendency to innovate uh, and to think of new ideas. So when he became the first chief prosecutor of the ICC, uh, as would be normal for him, but not for others, his first thought was, not, not only how do I organize the office from scratch, but how do I use this office to prevent human rights crimes, not just to prosecute them. So Luis, we're happy to have you here even though you've left your post and is now teaching at the other university um, down the coast <laughs> in New Haven. <laughs> Luis. Okay. happy to be here. I, I spent nine years of my life working in the ITC, and now I'm trying to understand and explain what I did, but I, people at Beth Simon make my life. Well, at least we can't hear you in the back. Okay. You not working this? Uh, did you turn it on? No. Uh, <laughs> can you do it? Thank you. It's right on the working now? Okay. I will. Is it working? <coughs> I will be loudly. Okay, I'm very happy to be here. That's okay? <laughs> Good. Uh, today, I like to, to come on Beth Simmons' paper because I think Beth Simmons' work is totally cutting edge. No one is saying what she's saying. So you have to take advantage that she's here and help her. First, for me, it's very interesting because Eric Posner, who is a really smart guy, is saying the first line. And in fact, one case is a failure because I promised zero days. I promised zero days because I said, this is a court of complementarity. First, always, it's better than no crime. The best scenario is no genocide. You don't need a court because that is a normative idea. People are not committing a crime. I always say, for me, the best explanation of what is the law is the subways in Berlin. You go to a Berlin subways, and you can take the subway with no control. Imagine a New Yorker in Berlin would never pay. I have a French and a German work offices in my office. They were in Brussels and they were telling me the story. They were going to the subway to take the subway and the train was coming. And the French lady said, run, run, we have to take this train. And the German say, it was tough, say, no, we cannot do it. Why not? The ticket office is closed. He cannot take the train with no ticket. That is the law. So, and that is for me with Eric Posner is mis misunderstanding. The law is not about punishing. The law is about citizens following the law. <coughs> and in fact, a court of complementarity means the court should not intervene if the national courts are conducting proceedings. That is Colombia. It would be illegal if the court jump on Colombia because Colombia are making, is making the effort to pursue the case itself. So, the judgment on ICC because the number of trials is, is a complete misunderstanding of the concept. The second idea uh, is fascinating for me because I think it's decided because it's too weak or too strong. It's too weak to deter, but please don't put ICC here because then we cannot negotiate. So these two ideas are at the same time. So they, you have crossing bullets. I love it, that's why I really, I love the irritant. Because that's what we are. We are irritating the peacemakers. Because basically, they want to go to a negotiation and make a deal. The problem, it is a deal between leaders. And the victims are in no. You, of course, it's easier to make a deal with Gaddafi. But then, the only way for Gaddafi to stay in power is to keep committing crimes. Gaddafi could not. They say, oh my God, I was, mis I was wrong, now we'll be democracy, free speech, no problem. It's impossible for Gaddafi to stay in power without committing crimes. That's why it's irritating. And today's discussion with Catherine, 
I think that's a big problem. That's why we need, we need Ben Simmons and Catherine both working on these issues. Because Nuremberg was highly irritating. But now it's a second cow. Because Hitler has no supporters. And the Nazi regime is gone. And we don't need Germany to fight communism. So now Nuremberg tries are great. I think why it was a disaster. Everyone was criticizing the why. But now it's gone. It's perfect. They are prosecuting all people. No problem. I think it would be always irritating. For the next 50 years, I think it would be irritating. And that, for me, is the reason that we need good scholars explaining well what we are doing here. Because if not, less support will be meaning that the court will be less efficient. And that would be my point today. It's about the fit and, and um, Beth said that the efficiency of the court is not about just the court itself. No, this is the last point she made. I love all your points, but the conclusion. Oh my god. Just drag it down. Yeah. Yeah, this one. For me, the issue is here is I don't think support for major power is support in general terms, and that was like a talk. Um, and also, this idea of mainstreaming ICC with the diplomatic efforts, that would increase what you could measure. Because, uh, example of that, I pursued Ahmed Haroun, the minister from Sudan, for crimes committed in Darfur. And I went to see an ambassador, because, and in those days I was more naive than later. Because I was never expected a Security Council referral. It was not in my plans. And when it came, I said it was a huge challenge how we prove the cases in Darfur, and we had to conduct a very difficult investigation from outside. We cannot visit the crime scene. But I think, for instance, we identified Ahmed Haroun. No one was talking about Ahmed Haroun. People were talking about Musa Hilal, who were militia leaders. They, because Bashir wanted to show militia leaders are committing the crimes. Ahmed Haroun was the Minister of State for the Interior, and then, <laughs> He, when the people were in the camps, he became the minister for humanitarian affairs, controlling the people in the camps. And then he became the governor of South Cordova, killing people in South Cordova. So he's the guy. He and Hussein are the two guys. No one knew about Hadou. We, we found him. And after we, we presented the case, we got the evidence, I was thinking, okay, now all the states who gave me the case will use this case to stop the crimes. They had no idea how to do it. I remember a conversation with an ambassador telling him, look, if you convince President Bashir to arrest Haroun, you stop the crime in Darfur. Because he's in charge, no one else will commit crime if the leader is in jail. And the ambassador told me, oh, it's a great idea. We cannot do it. Why not? Because we don't know how to do that. We have two tactics. Bombing or nothing. We had no tactic between bombing and nothing. And I was thinking of the joke, it's a description of reality. That's it. So that is the room you have to improve the number that they can measure. Because they need tactics, and they don't have. And that's for me the possibility of the Kennedy School is offering to you. They better tactics to the politician. And I would try. I would I prepared something to show that. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Okay. This is bad. And that for me is crucial. The goal of the SEC is to deter the crimes within the jurisdiction. That is crucial. Because for lawyers, the goal of the SEC is 
to conduct my trials, to make good arguments to the judges, and the judges discuss more liability. That is the lawyer thinking. Because that's the problem. One of the issues that this international justice has is there's no discipline covering it. I think you are one of the first, both of you, these two ladies here, are the ladies who are inventing the discipline. Because for international relations people, the law does not exist. It's a mistake to talk about the law. And, and then they can, that's why they can, they're irritated. They're irritated because what are you doing here? I remember, just to talk about the Uganda case, when, uh, okay, the, when we st I started, one of the biggest issues was how to start the case. What case? And then, I would be sure, okay, Uganda was my first. And then when I was working on that, a very nice ambassador from a very nice country came to my office to explain to me how it would be a huge mistake. He said, look, you are going to investigate Joseph Kony? The end. We cannot negotiate more with him. And it's the only way to call the company in Uganda to negotiate with Joseph Kony. So I was thinking I was very clever. I told him, look, the ICC statute say that if you have evidence that there are reasons to believe the case will not serve the interest of justice, you can present to me and I can stop the case. And after my clever comment, he was laughing, not very diplomatically, saying, evidence? <laughs> so you have no idea what the peace process. He said, a peace process is a small light at the end of the tunnel. I have no evidence. And then he think again, saying, OK, you want me evidence? This is my evidence. I am calling Joseph Coney. He's not taking the phone. <laughs> I did not encourage him to present evidence. So he went to his, I, I move it. So, but basically, that's the way in which the politicians want to deter. Just do negotiation. They, want, they don't like to deter, they like to cease fire. They like to stop crimes with agreement between politicians. That's it. The, my first point was, okay, this is the most important activity. It's not about international relations. It's not about lawyers going to court. It's about stop the crimes. My point here is, this is not best invention. This is in the statute. The statute say the following in the preamble. Determined to put an end to the impunity for the perpetrators of these crimes and thus to contribute to the prevention of such crimes. So this is the goal of the statute. I remember I put this in my policy paper at the beginning. I had five with my lawyers. They were thinking this idea was not in the wrong statute. So this is crucial. Because that's why Eric Posner is confused. He's talking about how many trials we did. Who cares about that? There is no crime in there is no trial in Uganda, but there are no crimes in Uganda. So it's not about trial impact to prevent crimes. That is a concept. Uh, yes. Okay, second best idea is it's difficult to deter those persons who ter terrorize civilians. That is my contribution to, to you today. I like to highlight one aspect that maybe you can also measure, and it's the peer control. Peer control. Because even Joseph Coney was affected by peer control. To understand Joseph Coney crimes, you have to understand, North Uganda is a, is a country with five kingdoms. When Museveni took office, he was from the south. And he, because he distracted Acholi from the north, he expelled Acholi from the army. And when he sent troops to the north, for the Acholis was an intrusion, an invasion. Was like, imagine if uh, Massachusetts received troops from Alabama in 1810. It's an intrusion. What are they doing here? No, and you fight them. And that's what they did. Alice Lacuena was a leader fighting Museveni troops. At the end was a peace agreement, Alice Lacuena left, and then Joseph Coney replaced her. But basically, Joseph Coney was fighting in the name of the Acholi against Museveni. After years, Joseph Coney, who is the most difficult character in this sense, because he's not committing crimes to gain political power, what he likes to have is his own group. And Joseph Coney is attacking the Acholi community. And when we intervened there, the Acholi community hated more Museveni than Coney. Even Coney was attacking them. 
and the, anthro the, the, international, the Western anthropology is similar. And human rights group normally similar. Human rights group normally present both, two bad guys, Connie and Museveni. And that was the narrative. And in some way, the international political narrative, we don't care political issues, we care about who commit crimes, change the mind. Because they start to understand that, yes, we have to stop the crimes for different reasons. And so, I believe peer control is something you should add. And peer control helping even with Joseph Coney. And now we go back to this. So, Best presents three ideas, the persecution directly, the member states, and the international community as a whole. I would say two and three is the point that I was trying to make. The number three is, that, is exactly what I explained. The actually community changed her mind because the ICC narrative transformed Connie into also a criminal against them. And with the lack of the so social support, is one of the reasons Connie left Uganda, because he, got, he did not receive now the assistance he was receiving before. I would suggest a similar thing is in Colombia. I always remember when I went to Colombia, the first time, they were dealing with paramilitaries. And the guy who was running the peace pro the, the, the initiative said, look, you have to understand, you are making our life complicated with the paramilitaries. Because you are requesting more than we are expecting to do. However, we, you are solving our problem the fact. Because since you are here, the FARC, the guerrillas, became criminals. Before that, they were political leaders, opposition. So the ICC narrative is transforming the game. That is something I don't know how you can measure, but should be measured. And uh, yes, I was trying to present the second point. I think you have missing something on the second point. It's not just about member state formal rules. It's about political leaders. Sarkozy led the process to, to transform Gaddafi from a global leader to a, into a criminal, a global criminal. So with the leadership of Sarkozy, Cameron, and Qatar. So it's not just about rules and, and law. It's about political leadership. And that's about, for me, it would be great if you can measure how many leaders are committing massive atrocities. That would be an interesting number. It probably would be 5% of leaders, not many. But the issue is, even 95% of the leaders are not committing massive atrocities, are they still accepting these guys into the club or not? That is, for me, the crucial, crucial issue. Because Gaddafi was committing crimes in Libya when he made a deal, and he was in the club. In 2009, Gaddafi was the chairperson of the African Union, member of the Security Council, and president of the General Assembly of the UN. No one but he was in picture with Berlusconi, Ban Ki-moon, Condi Rice, Tony, Tony Blair was visiting him all the time. Global leader. His crimes were ignored. And suddenly, two years later, for some reason, including political leadership, it changed but no more accepted into the global community leadership. Your question, yes, go. Este. So, Luis, yeah. Okay, I promised on the poster that you would talk about Syria. Oh my God, yes. And, <laughs> no, and we have 20 minutes and I want to leave time for questions. <coughs> so I would like you to, to, I know this is great, and we're going to leave, we're going to okay, let, let me finish, okay, I go, I go now to your point. <laughs> okay, I follow the casino in France, totally. <laughs> because my point was the following. Michael Howard, great historian, say there are three moments. From the last 5,000 years, people were using wars to solve conflicts. The idea of permanent peace is new. Before that, people were just time between war and war. So peace was the time between war and war. The idea that permanent peace came with Westphalia, 1648, was still had to be implemented. The idea of justice to solve conflict is 2003. Because I think why Nuremberg were attempts, but the idea of a system, permanent justice, is 2003. And that's why we are the critical moment on humanity. Because the problem I see, and that is your point, 
Politicians are used to the permanent, to the 1648 idea. Any type of agreement will be okay. People, the young people here, I'm saying young people, I'm not. Some, those young here, in fact, those 20s who born after the end of the Cold War, they believe the world is one world. They can talk by cell phone. They can communicate by internet. That's normal life for them. So they are the last paradigm. But the problem for me, to increase the efficiency of deterrence, politicians have to understand how to play, how to include justice in the framework. In the same way that any prosecutor in the, in, in the US will include the idea of to justice to control massive criminals, organized crime. You, when you deal with organized crimes, you use the law to disrupt the interventions. And you make deals, you make different things. That is not the way that politicians are thinking. And that's for me, if we can do that, bet number will be, will rise. And one idea that I presented, and Kathy is insisting now I should present in two minutes, is the following. Syria is a big problem. No one knows what to do with Syria. I cannot debate louder than that, but many people in the US government believe it the intervention of the court in Libya was wrong. Because, because when we indicted Gaddafi, we closed the door to a negotiation to Gaddafi to stay in power. And they believe it was wrong. I believe it was great. OK, it was my duty in any case. But the outcome, outcome was good. But they believe it was wrong. That's why there was no request to refer the case of Syria to the ICC. Zero. And as a consequence, we are where we are that now Assad will be not so bad today, and if the situation is following the same way, he will be the candidate for a Nobel Prize. Because that's where we are going, because he will fight in Al-Qaeda. That's what he will present. So how we manage that? How we manage Security Council to stop atrocity in Syria? The one idea that you can discuss is the following. If you refer the, ICC, the Syria to ICC, you really, <coughs> everyone is a criminal there. Everyone, including the rebels, everyone's a criminal. So all should be prosecuted, and you are adding problems. The law for the future, to organize the life of the people. So one idea to propose security council informed Syria that in 2015, January, will be the case of Syria will be referred to the SEC. So whoever commits crimes in 2015 could be prosecuted. So you got eight months to adjust, to stop the crimes. And to be sure that this creates leverage, as Beth say, the important thing is that can be caught. So to be sure this could impact, some state could say, look, if the Security Council requests the IT intervention, we'll plan how to execute arrest operations. With these two ideas in your pocket, then you send Kofi Annan to negotiate. And that will be a meaningful negotiation. And in particular, those in power will adjust. Because these massive atrocities are rational crimes. They are not crimes of passion. They are crimes committed to stay in power. So you, get in, you modify incentives to stay in power. If you want to stay in power, change your mind, change your behavior. So I see could change behavior without changing regime. That's the concept. And to finish, okay, finish. Uh, let me present. This is not my idea. This was Robert Jackson, the president of Nuremberg, saying in 1945, and we are not listening, 70 years ago, 69 years ago. He said, he talked about, in his opening statement, he talked about between impotence or war, between bombing or nothing. It's the same. He said, this principle of personal liability is a necessary as well as a logical one if international law is to render real help to the maintenance of peace. And he said, an international law which operates only on states can be enforced only by war because the most practical method of coercing a state is warfare. And he explained, American history show 
that one of the compelling reasons for adoption of our constitution was that the laws of the confederation, which operated only on constituent states, were found ineffective to maintain order among them. The only answer to recalcitrance was impotence or war. Only sanctions, which really individual, can peacefully and effectively be enforced. So that is the whole idea we are trying to show is, is the most innovative idea today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. questions for uh, uh, both Beth and Luis. So. You have a question? Yeah. What? Yes, Joe, you want to start? Um, just picking up on the, uh, the only sanctions which reach individuals and going back to Beth's presentation, um, I wonder what you think about sort of surveys and attitudes you know, to prove from a more sort of anecdotal way, actually it was ICC which deterred me. Uh, you know, talking to the LRA or all that, because what I would like to see is a sort of companion, like a Pew study of social attitudes towards the ICC. Yours is quantitative, <coughs> comparing numbers, but what about the idea of testing with talking to people who've committed crimes or not? Well, I mean, no, that would be that would be fantastic research. That's on the ground. Research, I mean, my, I have to admit, my connections with rebels are really thin. And uh, <laughs> I, I, don't have the, I don't have the connections to do that. I um, but you, you probably I, I, yeah. I know that. So, um, so it wouldn't be my strength, but I think it's completely legitimate and important research to do. Uh, you know, the other thing, when you said sort of Pew research, I mean, there are all kinds of things on kind of mass attitudes towards the ICC. So there are public opinion polls, and there you can gauge a little bit about you know, from various societies, from Ugandan society and Kenyan society, how, whether, and to what extent they take the ICC seriously. And if you're talking about sort of social pressures and costs, you can you can get a little feel from that. But I, but you know, that what you're talking about is um, that that would be very interesting research to do. I just have a feeling you probably couldn't just it couldn't be your opening question. So were you deterred by the ICC? You no, have to you have to give some clever it, ways it, to, to talk about. You got pictures of Nikunda. A killer in Kibbutz with the ICC wrong treating his death. Yeah. I have a lawyer who was invited yeah. by Joseph Coney to the middle of the jungle yep. to hear, ask him, Can you explain to me why they are saying I commit crimes against humanity? And he was surrounded by 300 kids abducted. Uh, 300 kids, children abducted. So, Barney Afaku, the name of the lawyer, who is a jolly, said, Can we go to a more private place? <laughs> no, no, do it here. So, Barney Afaku in a surreal moment explained to Joseph Coney why he communicates against humanity surrounded by 300 kids abducted. Okay. And we have 20 stories of that. Yeah. So we don't need to use. Yeah. I also understand, for example, that the uh, rebels in Colombia actually have written position papers about yeah. what are the chances that we will be prosecuted by the ICC. So they're very aware. Um, uh, and I think you know, some of these things are sort of surfacing. So, but uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, we don't need to. Yep. Who managed this? I'm gonna let you call. You mind having? Who managed it? I'm gonna let you guys call people. Ah, okay. Uh, I wanted to just ask, and in determining the terms based on the people showing up as evidence of deterrence selected among the ratifiers of the ICC, it seems to me that you would only join the ICC or sign on to the ICC if you really, to some degree, intended to follow it because you place yourself at a much greater risk or greater certainty that something that you could be prosecuted. So I guess I'm wondering if you're measuring it against people who are already a community of believers and then also by comparing, deciding whether there's deterrence, when you're comparing impunity versus prosecution, you kind of set the bar really low that you know, one conviction is enough to create, you know, more deterrence than simply impunity. You know, I, yeah, I, I you're right. like for that one conviction, there's also a whole host of people who've gotten away with these mass atrocities that, I don't know, I didn't find it particularly compelling, but I'm sure you have an answer. So the first one, the first question is sort of, why would you even compare this to that if I don't think it's You know, those are the ones that are going to comply anyway. And that is, that's absolutely everybody's first 
reaction to any ratification of any treaty have any kind of consequences. So that, that's kind of the, a, a traditional way. So yeah, there's a lot of ways to think about that. And one is to try to control for all the obvious things that are going to affect your likelihood of being you know, sort of in favor of this treaty or not. So you have to develop the right kind of test for it. And so you, know, you develop controls for those states who would ratify and would obviously kind of say, you know, have other things correlated with a preference for going along with the treaty. And then secondly, remember the problem of time inconsistency. What might look like a good idea right now in 1998 or, or 99 or 2000 can come back to bite you you know, in 2008 and 2009. So, you know, it's not a foregone conclusion that exactly the consequences, exactly the conditions in place when you ratified will be those that you may be facing. And so you expose yourself to risk that way. But you don't see a king is good. This is a map. It's a legal issue. The, blue, the, the countries in blue sign the treaty. So there is legal. It's a legal obligation to respect the law because the people could intervene there. In the white countries, there is no real obligation. Security countries can be fair basis, but it's, a political, it's almost a political decision. So I think it's great that they just took the legal, those were the legal obligation. They adopt the legal obligation. They are forced. The others say, why we should bother me with the ICC? That has nothing to do. So it's a perfect thing. And also, I think that you heard is it's ICC against immunity. Because it's not ICC against Stockholm. It's ICC against immunity. You know, in, in Copenhagen, the chief of police, five topic, five priorities, that not be good crime. Because there's almost no crime there. Okay, we should not compare a primitive world with Copenhagen. The world is not Copenhagen, the world is primitive and basic. So what is happening is an emerging trend, presented by Captain Timmy, saying the people are going to check this out. 122 states are members of this. And that's I would, I, the assumption is completely perfect. The wrong assumption is just why we are not returning to in Syria. We are not returning to in Syria because we have nothing to do with Syria. How we could evaluate a, a, a US prosecutor who is not returning to in Syria? It's a contradiction. Same as the sea has no jurisdiction in Syria. So the only possible nation is in the blue countries. I also just maybe yeah, I have one. Do you agree now or not? Do you agree now or not? No, people don't check your mind. You see? I got it. Sorry? I was, why would you support it? I mean, you don't think it works, right? So, um, but anyway, uh, just one other little answer to your question, and that is all the results on rebels, of course, rebels didn't ratify these treaties, did they? So that's a super hard test for the ability of the institution to deter. They were not parties. So you can't see using the, ratifying the ICC as a way to get the ICC to get your rebel group to stop? Like, maybe that there's a sense of it being used but that, that you are taking, they are taking the argument that they will prosecute too. Any, any prosecutor in Boston will receive complaints from lovers, former lovers, former partners, bad people, mafia guys who like to, to destroy the other mafia. It's normal. Bad people also make claims. So what? What's the difference? Yeah, just a normal opinion. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thanks. Um, I think that they pretty much knew about the investigations pretty quickly. I mean, you may, you can speak to that too, um, but... The uh, investigation didn't happen until, I think, was it 2006 or 2007? No, 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 no. The investigation was opened on uh, July 2004, yeah. and in the July negotiation, they did not talk about the investigations. Right. They collapsed without talking about the ICC. 2005, we came. But the crucial element that we find, you don't find it in the, in the literature, is in addition to the effort of the South-North Agreement, the Sudanese signed an agreement with IC Prosecution Office to arrest the Fconi. What they were looking for was immunity for the Sudanese. They were afraid because I have a meeting with the Sudanese Foreign Affairs Minister, and he said, 2004 was, he said, 
you know, we're, so, we're supporting the NRA, but we stopped three years ago, meaning 2001, not jurisdiction of the SEC. So they were really worried about the SEC, that we prosecuted them, and then, therefore, they signed a treaty in agreement with us to arrest Connie. That's why, when Connie, when we issued our warrant, and Connie moved from Sudan to Garamba Park, was in, in big part because of this agreement. And, in addition to that, talking about the peer control, you know, Uganda and Congo has a very difficult relation because they have a case before the SJ. However, because this agreement was with Sudan, Uganda, Congo, and Sudan, the three of them, were against Joseph Kony suddenly because the legal system created by the SEC. And that's showing your point. Mr. you have a case of a successful attempt to, to try a, a rebel, the case of Bahra al -Gurdan. And I hope you, yeah. you, you will have a, you know, because that is, that is a case that happened um, while, uh, you know, a, a rebel leader wanted to embarrass the Sudan government yeah. by saying, I'm the rebel going to the ICC voluntarily, yeah. while the, 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 the yeah. president doesn't want to, to, to show up in the so if you can elaborate on that, and, and, and the case of um, the African Union and the ICC, the ICC uh, it looks like uh, uh, you know, Bashir won the narrative in terms of discrediting the ICC and uh, calling it um, a, 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 a court against African leaders, uh, if you can comment on that as well. Okay, I, I think an African Union decision attacking me personally are showing her point, the terror impact. Irritant. Yeah? You're an irritant. Yes, I am, I am highly irritant. And I, can, I have a story about that. It's funny. Because they are saying, basically, one African leader told me, Luis, don't worry about these statements. The problem is, there are at least 10 heads of state in Africa who really are afraid of you. We like that. The problem is, they pay together and they point this topic against you at the top, at the top of the agenda. If we don't agree with them, they ruin the entire meeting. So we have to say, yes, and we criticize you and insult you. But you know what? No one is withdrawing. Zero withdrawing. They're always announcing withdrawing, zero withdrawing. There are talks that journalists follow and some academics follow, but real, nothing. Okay? Something I, if you know, we have 32 in the ITs, in the SEC. You know the rate of fugitives? 20%. And that's the core. I was at Harvard when I was appointed. I remember a colleague of mine telling me, Luis, it's an honor, but refuse it. Why? Because without U.S. support, you cannot investigate, you cannot arrest. So it would be a shame for you. It would be nine years a decade doing nothing and receiving a salary. That was his prediction. Everyone was predicting in 2003 that the court could not move. I, am, I love the criticism today because showing is an institution. That is a huge change we have in the world. Today, in the last few months, you can see the Commission of Inquiry in North Korea requesting the ICC intervention in North Korea, Crimea Parliament requesting intervention in ICC, Israel-Palestine thing, the big deal is the Palestine are threatening Israel to present the case for ICC. So, we have a new institution now, and that, that's why my, my comment of 5,000 years, 300 years, and 10 years is a new institution. We get them plain and used properly. Let me just add one little thing, because actually I am concerned about the uh, African Union position. And the reason is that my conception of social deterrence um, implicitly sort of thinks of that as being the international community. But what if, uh, you know, what, what if uh, alleged criminals are able successfully to re redefine the relevant social community to just be at the close sort of region of other politicians who have kind of similar interests. And I think that potentially is detrimental to looking at social deterrence, to the effects of social deterrence, which I'm stipulating and trying to test. It's sort of, the, yeah, I'm sort of thinking about the international community as being the relevant social community, but what if that's wrong? What if the relevant social community is very regional and uh, can be redefined as such? Then social deterrence could erode. So that's, that's what I think. And, and it kind of goes back to this peer control idea, right? If you define your peers as your kind of local region they, and they're sort of just wanting to defend impunity, then that's, depends, that's a risky depends. problem. In, in, in Europe it's okay, but in America it's okay. Africa is complicated. Africa. Arab, Arab was bad, it was different, now it's complicated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So, well, well, what so no, well, our time is up, and so one, I want to really thank our speakers, and I want to say that they really modeled for us the kind of program that we at the CAR Center are really committed to, and that's a program that brings together cutting edge research, top level practitioners to address the pressing problems of our day. Thank you so much. Thank you.